Welcome to Coffee Talk Tuesday. My name is Shelley Stevens, and I'm here with Trip Mitchell and our incredible guest, Stacy Bess. And I'm so excited that you were able to come on our show. I have been inspired by you. I saw you speak probably two and a half years ago and bought your book. And I just, I'm really honored that you're on our show. So thank you thank so you. much. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, well, um, this is the part where I say something stupid, but usually. I'll let you go ahead. Why is Stacy so amazing? So Stacy, I'm actually, because you do this for a living, you tell your story, I'm going to let you talk about who you are and why you do what you do and, and, and your story. Okay. Well, I won't tell you how amazing I am, but I will tell you that I have Your PR had... person called earlier yeah. and said, you guys are so lucky. <laughs> Stacy is amazing. <laughs> So they've done that for me. Yeah, okay. So I I really kind of uh, landed in this job. I grew up with a mom who uh, worked in a shelter uh, for kids that were getting placed into um, into homes uh, that had been pulled from their own homes, being placed into foster care. And she would bring children home to live with us until they were placed into their homes. And so growing up, we were always being introduced to a child that needed us. And that was kind of, um, I think, kind of what set the stage for me to want to love a child in need. Um, but I, I honestly was getting my degree in elementary ed, uh, K-8 education, as a backup. I wasn't going to teach. Uh, but I have this really powerful mother and husband who conned me into going to the Salt Lake City School District. And mom said, hey, it's right before Christmas break. They'll never hire you. And and so just go. We just challenge you to go. So I went and uh, Dr. Manning offered me the job. And he said it is a, it is the only school of its kind in the entire country. It is underneath the Six South Bridge. Drive as far as you can go over the railroad tracks and then look to your left and you will see your school. It is a school for the homeless. And I remember saying to him, but sir, I have a degree in elementary ed. I'm not trained to teach grownups. And he giggled and giggled and said, Miss Stacy, this is a school for homeless children. And you will teach K through six all day. Well, I was horrified, absolutely horrified. I remember going out uh, into my little green celica in the back of the parking lot and I held onto the steering wheel as tight as I could, and I laid my head down, and I cried and cried and cried. And I just, all the way home, wiping the tears and the mascara, I kept saying, Mom and Greg, how dare you send me to this place? <laughs> and I remember walking in the door, and Greg opened up the screen door, and I opened up the, or he opened up the front door, and I opened up the screen door, and he looked at me, and he said, Oh, you got a job, didn't you? <laughs> I was horrified. So I, I knew I didn't have to take it. Everybody that loves me called me and said, no, 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 you, you don't have to take this job. Wait for a real job is what I kept, my family kept saying, get, get a real job. But I went to bed that night feeling pretty secure that I, was, I didn't have to take the job, but I dreamt about it and I processed it and processed it until finally I sat up in bed in the middle of the night and I said, Greg, Greg, I think I have to take this job. And he said, maybe, because you've been talking about it in your sleep all night. And I did that a lot for many nights. And then I went out into my living room where it was really dark. And I said out loud, why me? Why do I have to take this job? And I got the strangest thought race through my body. And the loudest voice said, why not you? You have had a lifetime of trials and triumphs. You'll be good at this. And so I accepted and then spent 11 years in, in terror and joy and sadness and exhilaration. Uh, so it's a day. different experience than probably any other school teachers in the country. Maybe there are a handful of educators around the country who are in the same experience, but you have something that no one else goes through well at the time absolutely because we were the only one and and the first one things were uh, groups were starting to to create these schools um 
But at that point, really no one knew what to do. No one knew how to treat uh, what I was doing. I was answering to the Salt Lake City School District and I was answering to the Traveler's Aid Society who ran the shelter. And I was this sweet, tender school teacher who represented the children. And, and, and it was a conflict back and forth of where I fit in. And, and, and I was always rallying for the children's needs and for what they needed. So it, yeah, I mean, I was here, I was 23 years old having to be in charge so you, of everything. You started this 12 years ago. So yes, <laughs> when I was just 30. Um, so, and it, what's been really fun about it is I built the experience, loved the experience, wrote about it, created, had the movie made and have been talking and teaching and loving, um, being an advocate for these people for 20 years. Mm. Let's talk about the kids. They are experiencing hardship that kids in this country at least don't experience. How was their spirits? Uh, what was that like? You know, that's a really interesting question because it depended upon your age. If you were K-1-2, you could look at it, and I won't tell you every child is the same, but you could look at it as a really fun camping experience. You had a lot of friends, everybody um, congregated in the family area together, they ate dinner together. It was it, it didn't uh, occur to them as intensely as it did with the older kids that it was not okay. So the older children, um, who tended to be very bright, not only street bright, but um, educationally really quite bright, were horrified by it. And they would say things like, um, I feel like a fish in a fishbowl when people come to see how sad the poor homeless children are. Mm. And that would break my heart. And so we practiced doing things that, that empowered them. I took them to the ballet. I took them to, um, out to dinner and showed them which forks to use and, and to, just took them to many places to teach them that they belonged out there. They, they were important, the important kids. And I didn't realize how, how great that was until they grew older and became parents and started finding me. And um, nobody ever, ever calls me and says, gosh, you were a great math teacher or a great writing <laughs> teacher. And I really thought I was. <laughs> but none of them call me and say that. What they say is, you believed in me. You told me over and over again that I was amazing. And I really believed it. So you were really an advocate. Over, that was your overarching role. I wanted them to understand that they had the power to rise above it all that it didn't have to be a generational behavior, that it didn't have to be, it just, it didn't have to be, um, you're stuck, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. This is what your family does. You know, when, when you're talking about this, it, it makes me like, it's so incredible that you've been able to do this. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about your book and what you write about in your book. But this is some of the stuff that I wish our normal public schools did with kids because yes it's important to learn math and english and science and all those things but it's more important to learn that because we, we all go through trials we all have these things and some worse way worse than others but we're not given skills like that right in in normal education systems like it's just learn 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 and then good luck with your life and it would be so incredible if there were more teachers that, that saw that or, or that had the capability to do things like that. Well, there's some really interesting research out there that says that when teachers build emotional relationships with their students, they tend to learn better. Right. And, and, and I don't know that at that young age and that's that what came to me. That's what happened to but, me. I didn't have an emotional relationship with the nuns who were beating me. Yeah. <laughs> And deservedly so, because I was a horrible <laughs> kid. But anyway, I'll not but, digress. But it really, there's some real truth to building those emotional connections to, to students. Um, they tend to ask more questions. They tend to be more comfortable in the classroom. I found that these children would literally sit in my doorway, sometimes on each other, all cuddled up into that doorway, waiting for me to open the door. And I, it used to really throw me that, you know, that they would wait right there. 
And I asked one of the students one day, why do you guys all sit here? And a fifth grade boy said, because this is childhood and we don't get a lot of that. Hmm. Wow. So getting in that classroom, and that's why I've always giggled that my I'm, I'm actually a good reading teacher and a good writing teacher, but that's not what they wanted. They wanted some stability. Where did so your school was basically under I-15 and Six South in, it was, initially? Yep, it was under the Six South Bridge, which is no longer there. It was about 455 West, and they were uh, the living quarters were box cars. There were 12 of them, and then inside of this big silver shed. Um, with rust dripping down the front, it's it's quite a, quite a picture to see. Um, was the the day area, and where the nursing facilities were, and the school. And so I remember pulling up that very first day, saying to myself, "You're lost. There's nothing that resembles a school here." And a, a 12 year old boy jumped out of one of the box cars and ran in right in front of my parked car and began to tie a shoelace. So I'm pretty bold by nature, so I rolled the window down and I was going to yell, "Hey, buddy, where's the school?" And this could this young man stood and he glared at me and I panicked and I said to myself don't run him over just turn yeah, and get yeah. on the other street as fast as you can but just as I was trying to turn um, my first dad came to the window to my passenger window um, and his name was Jim and Jim did not look at all like I wanted homeless people to look he had a long gray beard and, and he looked too old to be the dad, but he actually turned out to be one of the dads. And he leaned down into the window and knocked to try to get my attention. And I noticed on the side of his beard was this huge chunk of scrambled egg. And he kept leaning in to, to knock and his, the egg would touch the window. And I let out this horrible scream. And he came out around to my side. He interacted with that young man for a minute. But he came around to my side of the window and he smiled at me and just stared and then he said you lost and I said yeah and then with the funniest smile he had two teeth one right up here and one right down here he said are you the new teacher and mostly I wanted to lie but I was and he opened up the car door and he said come on we're dying to meet you Aww. so that was kind of my opening to a scary looking man wanting to help me. I remember handing him my briefcase, my purse, and my wire basket because all my friends said that all good teachers carry a wire basket. <laughs> so here he is holding all of my stuff and he looks me up and down and I'm in a navy blue suit. I'm in Naturally. navy blue tights, navy blue pumps. I have my leather briefcase. And he goes, oh, who hired you? <laughs> And I had to, I had to defend myself as I'm walking in there. And he goes, he points to the shed and said, "This is where you teach, and you're too proper for the streets. So teach and go home." And I, I'll never forget that day. But, but this cute gentleman did something knowing that I was young. He asked me to follow him. He said, "I've got some people that want to meet you. Follow me." And he put his hand on my shoulder and he took me to the far side of the bridge. I will tell you the 56 year old woman would not follow him today, but I walked all the way to the far side of the bridge and there stood about 15 moms and dads. And it was terrifying to me. And as I got into the circle, Gretchen opened the circle and she said, honey, you're shaking. Are you cold? I wasn't cold. I was, was terrified. terrified. But I'll never forget what they said, and I think your listeners need to understand this. I was worried they were going to ask me if I w could teach their kid to read. I was afraid they were going to say, oh, my kid doesn't read or he needs better spelling help. But not one parent said that to me. Every single one of them in their own unique way said, my child has suffered a lot. Could you love him? Oh. And it was the most amazing interaction because I left that circle saying, okay, I'll be all right. I can do that. I will spend all of my energy making sure your kid knows he's okay. Hmm. And that, it was kind of like an answer saying, hey, you, this is what these families want. They also told me something naughty about their child, which delighted me. Because I always say that I've got a magnet on my forehead that's invisible that says if you're full of it, 
If you need to tell me a joke when it is not appropriate to do so, I want to be your teacher. <laughs> and I truly was the perfect personality for these kids because I would have to turn my head many times and smile when a, a very reasonable teacher would not be smiling. So I loved them. I found them hilarious. And as they got older and became parents and would f and find me, I'm, I'm amazed at what they remember. Absolutely amazed. Wow. In summer 2004, as a four-year-old Caleb's body emerged from an overcrowded water parks pool in Utah, every mother's worst nightmare became reality for Shalise Stevens. Would healing ever begin? Without an answer, she experienced truths about deep loss and grief's throttle. By age 40, she awakened to joy and motherhood. Finding 40, available on Amazon and wherever digital copies are sold.